Today we return to the organic movement to discuss the one person apart from Lady Eve Balfour that the Soil Association is prepared to admit that it's ideologically linked to, and that person is Sir Albert Howard, who is quoted on their website saying, The health of soil, plants, animals and human is one and indivisible. That is blood and soil ideology, plain and simple. But we're moving slightly away from the politics of the organic movement towards the so-called science of it. Albert Howard did believe in blood and soil ideology, as you see in that quote, but he had a slightly different angle to Lymington and his friends. The organic movement at its core was a group of friends. Kinship and husbandry was just 12 people, and they wanted peasants back, and they didn't like the scientists who we're going to discuss in the next few episodes. Realistically, they were never going to win the debate for the countryside because everybody could see that they were fascist cranks, but they needed science to support their beliefs if they were to hope to compete with the empirical results being churned out by the government-backed research stations. They started the Howley experiment, which we've discussed, but there also emerged a character called Albert Howard, who was notionally a scientist that Lymington and his friends were prepared to hide behind. But they don't actually like Albert Howard on a personal level, he's not in their friendship group. Albert Howard had done famous work in India on agricultural stations, where practical experience had turned him into a fanatic convert to compost and non-chemical manures. Good as he was, he was too one-sided to be wholly practical. For the same reason, it was easier to find him livable than lovable, or to be taken into intimate friendship, but I learned much from him. We can take from this that Albert Howard didn't share Lymington's beliefs about social hierarchy, but rather believed in organic agriculture and blood and soil for its own sake. He was a true believer. This makes it possible to look at Albert Howard with a slightly more favourable lens than we might use for Lymington. But I would like to emphasise that in this period, the word organic was a fascist category that the fascists claimed as their own. It was claimed at the time, and is sometimes repeated in secondary literature, that Lord Northbourne coined the term organic in his book Look to the Land, which he himself denied. But we must remember that Albert Howard was promoting organic agriculture at a time when organic agriculture and fascism were undeniably linked. And he makes contributions to the organic movement. He helps Lady Balfour write The Living Soil, and he goes to Lymington's Farley Estate state when they're thinking about setting up an organic experiment. Lymington also wrote Stapledon in, and Stapledon takes the opportunity to wind Albert Howard up. Stapes was impish and provocative, casting a fly over Albert Howard, and when he rose to it, digging him in the ribs like a naughty schoolboy. So Albert Howard is a bit of a funny character. The organicists are quite happy to exploit him, but they don't like him, and Stapledon, who is a credible scientist, doesn't take him very seriously. I wanted to discuss Albert Howard because when reading about Liebig's chemical theory of plant nutrition, I came across the humus theory he debunked, which seemed very similar to what Howard argued in the 1930s and 40s. In essence, Howard was trying to return to science that had been debunked many decades before he was writing. He says Liebig and the agricultural science that followed him didn't consider that humus theory as then expressed might be wrong, but humus itself might be right. Humus theory was able to exist because people before Liebig didn't really know how plants got their nutrients. Francis Bacon believed water formed the principal nutrient of plants and soil just kept them upright and protected them from extreme temperatures. Plants would draw up the particular juice they needed from the soil and deplete it for itself and similar plants, but not necessarily for different ones, which is why crop rotation works. But experiments were conducted where plants were grown in different conditions but had equal access to water, and different results were produced, so that was debunked and the focus turned to soil. This is when you get Jethro Tull's belief that nutrients come from the soil, so earth must be cultivated and broken down into particles small enough to be absorbed by the plant, and he invented a horse hoe to achieve this. But this was also demonstrably incorrect because breaking soil down and growing crops without obeying the rule of return just depletes the soil and yields decrease. Then emerged a humus theory of plant nutrition. J.G. Valerius, a chemist, concluded in 1761 that humus, the top layer of the soil containing decaying organic matter, was the source of food for the plant, while the other components of soil maintain the condition of the humus. Chalk and salts help to dissolve the humus into a form the plants can access. Clay helps protect it from washing away in the rain. So manures can either provide humus directly or have some indirect effect. There's two categories. Within the bounds of what was known at the time, this wasn't a terrible theory, but it was incorrect. Humphrey Davy believed plants don't generally take carbon from the air. They get it mostly from the soil through their roots. So oil and soot make good manures because of their carbon content. 
After this, Liebig founded agricultural science as we understand it today by looking at the chemical composition of manures. But I mention these older debunked theories because Humus theory's emphasis on organic matter in the soil as the giver of life, in contrast to modern chemical analysis, is something that Albert Howard revives. The Liebig tradition is that any deficiencies in the soil solution can be made up by the addition of suitable chemicals. This is based on a complete misconception of plant nutrition. It is superficial and fundamentally unsound. It takes no account of the life of the soil, including mycorrhizal association. Artificial manures inevitably lead to artificial nutrition, artificial food, artificial animals, and finally to artificial men and women. It's blood and soil. Howard was the son of a farmer. He had a degree in biological science from Cambridge and he ran the Institute of Plant Industry, a government research station in Indore, central India, between 1924 and 1931. So Howard was trained as an agricultural scientist, but when he went to India, he found the peasants working the land used agricultural techniques perfectly in harmony with their environment. Despite his training, he didn't have much to add. So he comes to the conclusion that agricultural science, unless it's grounded in practice, is a complete waste of time and to be fair there is a grain of truth in this people who know the land will know what's best for it there are instances we will discuss in the future where agricultural scientists try to do stuff against the warnings of the native cultivators and it goes catastrophically wrong so in opposition to conventional agricultural science howard devised what would be promoted as an alternative to the manufacture of nitrogen fertilizer a particular method of composting that produced humus through what he termed the indoor method. The principle is that you mix vegetable wastes and animal wastes. Howard bedded his cattle on vegetable wastes so the two were mixed when the cattle were mucked out every day. The dirt the cattle sheds were built upon would also be dug out and replaced every three months, and this urine earth would be used as a combined activator and base in composting. This mixture would then ferment. Chalk and limestone must be added to neutralize acidity, and the amounts of water and air must be carefully regulated. This is basically composting, and there are lots of good things to be said for it. It's in the spirit of a cyclical economy, it makes use of wastes which we love. But it's also very labour intensive. The humus must be turned once after two to three weeks, again three weeks later, and then it must be harvested and stored. You could now do this with machines, but this method was designed for societies that had a surplus of agricultural labour peasantries. Howard was inspired by the methods of nature as seen in the forest and the orient, which is very common in organicist thought. They compared China, a stable peasant society, to capitalist Rome, which fell. In China, a nation of observant peasants has worked out for itself simple methods of returning to the soil all the vegetable, animal and human wastes that are available. But Howard was inspired much more immediately by the peasants that he met in India, who operated within an organic cycle much like the indoor method. And Howard really liked like that. He seems to genuinely believe in the social and health benefits of peasantries. He wants people to be sustained by the soil where they live. He wants soil, plants, animals and people to exist within the same cycle and he complains that British farmers import feedstuffs so our livestock is supported by foreign soils and he complains that cities exist for the same reason. Our animal industry is becoming just as unbalanced as regards to the supply of nutrient grown on fertile soil as our urban population. Cities can't exist in their current form if we're to have a circular economy. Food waste and human excrement are lost to the land in Britain. They will become sewage or landfill. Waste materials are treated as something to get rid of as quickly, as unostentatiously and as cheaply as possible. The waste of the population in most Western countries are first diluted with large volumes of water and then with varying amounts of purification are discharged either into the rivers or into the sea. So the problem here isn't that farmers are destroying the planet, but rather that towns exist. Towns break the cycle. From the point of view of farming, the towns have become parasites. They will last under the present system only as long as the Earth's fertility lasts. Then the whole fabric of our civilization must collapse. So we once again return to the idea that Western civilization is unstable. But nature and Chinese peasant society is stable. So if the West is to be saved, it must become natural. We must return to peasantries. But unlike Limington, Howard doesn't seem to be motivated by social hierarchy. I think he genuinely believes that blood and soil will produce health and to this end he designs a modern peasant village that doesn't have an aristocrat. A plot of four acres should be taken on the outskirts of a town and 20 houses built upon it. The houses shall all face south and they will be set upon the plot in a diamond shaped pattern. 
Houses thus arranged will not block each other's sunlight. The whole plot would be treated as one garden, and one whole-time gardener would be responsible for the cultivation. The community would produce humus rather than liquid sewage, and each householder would pay the gardener a small fee and in return get fresh vegetables to their door and the amenity of their surroundings, rather than paying bin men to take waste away as they do in western towns. This is a very interesting idea. It's an interesting mix of the organicist blood and soil ideology and also Stapledon's progressive planning. There is a lot to be said for this, but I fear it suffers from the same fundamental problem as organic farming more broadly in that there are now too many people in Britain for it to feed them all. Waterborne sewage has developed because of overcrowding and the absence of cultivated land. Remove overcrowding and the case for this wasteful system disappears. Remove overcrowding. England has become very densely populated since we lost our peasantries and we haven't supported ourselves with our own soil, even with conventional agriculture, for many centuries now. Applying this here would mean getting rid of quite a lot of people. Howard's attitude to science is quite extreme, which explains why Stapledon wound him up when they met at Farley. Must agricultural science go on discovering more and more new pests and devising more and more poison sprays to destroy them? Or is there an alternative method of dealing with the situation? He thinks there is. Insects and fungi are not the real cause of plant diseases, but only attack unsuitable varieties or crops imperfectly grown. Pests must be looked upon as nature's professors of agriculture. The policy of protecting crops from pests by means of sprays, powders and so forth is unscientific and unsound, and even when successful, such a procedure merely preserves the unfit. This is a bit of a weird thing to say because it implies that a harmonious state of nature would not involve disease. Of course, nature has nature's professors of agriculture working within it. That's where the diseases and parasites evolved. It doesn't make sense. But Howard seems to think that his methods make organisms invulnerable to disease. Textbook blood and soil stuff. I have several times seen my oxen rubbing noses with foot and mouth cases. Nothing happened. The healthy, well-fed animals reacted to this disease exactly as suitable varieties of crops, when properly grown, did to insects and fungus pests no infection took place. Nature has provided a marvellous piece of machinery for conferring disease resistance on the crop. This machinery is only active in soil rich in humus. Howard berates agricultural science for apparently missing this, and he also berates the government for supporting it. Agricultural research has been misused to make the farmer not a better producer of food, but a more expert bandit. He has been taught how to transfer capital in the shape of soil fertility in the reserves of his livestock to his profit and loss account. In business, such practices end in bankruptcy. In agricultural research, they may lead to temporary successes. All goes well as long as the soil can be made to yield a crop. But soil fertility does not last forever. Eventually, the land is worn out. Real farming dies. This is an anti-capitalist critique of science. Remember that, the scientists have some very interesting views on capitalism. Howard's writings are important because they are entirely in keeping with the organicist brand of fascism. Hatred of capitalism, hatred of scientists, focus on peasantries as the natural condition for a human society. But he comes at it from a different angle. He's not fighting the aristocratic class interest. Rather, he's attacking scientists from a pseudo-scientific position himself. Howard was wrong to emphasise soils have not run out in the decades since he warned they would. The blood and soil argument against disease is just fascist twaddle, and the idea that scientists haven't considered the living components of soil is simply ridiculous. It wouldn't be very scientific of them, would it? It's been well established by scientists that you need healthy soil biology in addition to use of fertilizers. And products like the herbicide glyphosate are broken down by microorganisms in the soil, so work with the soil biology. What Howard argued was partially true in that it is possible to use scientific methods in such a way that are damaging. You can use nitrogen fertilizer in such a way that it damages soil biology. But I'm sure there are very few soil scientists who would encourage you to do that. But Howard takes that fact, the fact that scientific methods could in some circumstances be damaging to argue that we should do away with fertilizer and scientific agriculture altogether, which is a bit silly. But Howard establishes a notionally scientific opposition to scientific agriculture, which is something we're very used to hearing about today. As we move forward, we'll trace this line of thought through to the modern age. Just a little quick one today, I hope you found it interesting. Next week we'll be talking about capitalism and how it relates to the land, because we need to cover the main themes before we talk about what the scientists wanted. And they wanted to completely eradicate the landlord class and nationalise all of the land in Britain, making the government the landlord, which is almost as radical as what their organicist opponents were arguing. Do subscribe, I'll see you then.
the yearly round. That's the secret. To change the crops and to work crops and livestock together so that the goodness of the land is never lost.